Wow, you guys are great. Can you please come to all of my events? This is amazing. Um, I've never had a room go so quiet. <laughs> I didn't even have to whistle or anything. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Volvo Ocean Race, to the Magenta Project, and of course, International Women's Day, held today to celebrate the achievements of women from around the world, crossing nations. And that today, my friends, is exactly what we're going to be doing this evening. Tonight, we're going to take you on a journey throughout the Volvo Ocean Race and the women who have pioneered and conquered it, both past and present. We've got representatives from all of the previous all-female teams, from the Volvo and Whitbread Round the World Race, plus some upcoming sailing talent who are aspiring to advance in the sport. Now, some practicalities. If you need the bathroom, if you go down the stairs, round the corner and follow, and if you find it, please let me know. Um, if there is an emergency, the fire exits are to the right-hand side or the left, and yes, that is very difficult to do when you're facing the opposite direction. Um, I would probably opt for the ocean. Uh, <laughs> it's much safer. Now, if there is an emergency, please exit before tweeting about it. So, um, first up, we're going to hear about the Magenta Project and what it's aiming to achieve uh, for women in the sport of sailing. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome to the stage, she's three times Volvo Ocean Racer. She is a boat captain on board Team Brunel, my co-host for this evening and also the organiser of this evening. Please, can you put your hands together for the rather fabulous Abby Ayla. Oh, woo! <laughs> fun. Thank you. <laughs> so, a little bit about the Magenta Project, and uh, firstly, it's just fantastic to see so many of you here, so thank you, thank you for your support. Um, the Magenta Project was formed at the conclusion of the Team SCA campaign. Team SCA started out as an ambition to be competitive at the highest level. And what became obvious as we went round the world was that we, we were building a huge following, providing inspiration, and we're building that fan base. And not just women, we had people uh, of all ages, men, women, schools, groups, approach us at the stopovers and sharing stories of how they've been inspired to go further, to dream big. And that was moving, humbling, and pretty exciting. And I think we all felt, as the sailing team, an obligation to keep that momentum going and to harness the achievements to benefit others. Sailing is a sport that rewards experience. There are no shortcuts in getting to the top, and as with any profession, the answer comes from hard work, building skills, and gaining experience. And yet sometimes gaining that experience is the hardest part. And for exactly that reason, the project is underway to provide the opportunities to gain experience, develop skills, and have a chance to excel at the elite level of sailing. Last year, just to name a few programs, we were involved with training on the Volvo 65, and we gave a dozen women experience on that boat, some of whom have gone on to compete in this race. Um, we supported teams to compete on the World Match Racing Tour, qualifying events. We ran some GC32 training, and we s collaborated with Foiling Week with the help of Joe Aller, who's here tonight, so thank you, Joe, um, to provide exclusive um, access to foiling boats. Um, we ran M32 high-performance clinics in the US, Spain, and Sweden. We're an organization craving collaboration. There's no going it alone for the mountain that we have to climb, and we need your support, your advice, your feedback, and we would welcome any of those tonight. Um, we're going to leave some post-it notes at the back of the room there, and please just write us some messages of anything, good, bad, ugly, and stick them on the wall at the back, and we'll review them, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll take away an action from tonight. So first up on our journey through the Volvo Ocean Race tonight, I was lucky enough to catch up with Tracy Edwards, MBE, who was the skipper of Maiden, the very first all-female team that competed in the Whitbread Race, and we're going to hear a few words from her. My 
it really occurred to me as we were going around, okay, there's 230 people in this race and there's four girls and I'm having the time of my life and why didn't I know about this and why don't other girls know about this and what is going on? I look back now at the reaction that I got and of course I understand it now because I was a stewardess cook who'd done one race around the world who was going to suddenly put an all-female crew together to race around the world and of course everyone was going, um, but no, I don't think you can do that because, it, you know, that would be the obvious reaction. I mean, now I know that, but at the time I was like, what do you mean I can't do that? Don't tell me what I can and can't do. So that belligerent streak in me sort of rose to the surface, thank good goodness. There was no continuity. There was no sort of sense of girls going from one thing to the next, um, which of course is, is what is now being addressed by the Magenta Project. So pretty much everyone we took was someone that came to us and made the effort and said, I have got to be on this team. So to get to the start line itself was an achievement. And I, I, I remember clearly the, the feeling I had when we crossed the start line and I looked around at all these huge professional, you know, the maxis and all these guys and everything, who'd all been really supportive, I have to say. It was only people from outside the sailing world that hadn't, you know, sort of uh, said we could do a Peter Blake and Skip Novak. They were like, yeah, absolutely, get on with it. So there was that sense of, of build up and then crossing the start line was just this, I mean, I cried a lot and there was just this sense of um, release, you know, that we were going to be able to now do what we initially set out to do. And what I really, really wish I had known or understood at the time was how important it was to keep the momentum going because we didn't. I mean, we did in the press and the media and I did interviews and we, we kept the maiden idea alive, but I would give anything to go back in time and have the next Whitbread project on the table ready to go. Um, because that's always been the problem, I think, you know, with, you know, there's always been these great female projects in, in the Volvo um, and but then it's a stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, and, and there's no continuity. And what I really hope happens after this Volvo is that maybe all the girls that have been on the different boats get together, that maybe Volvo can give them a boat, um, that there can be some funding, and that this continuity can happen because, you know, that's what I love so much about the Magenta Project is this, is this understanding that this needs to continue. And you can't just throw some girls on a boat and then stop and then put another all-female crew together and it's not about all-female crews anyway it was always about men and women sailing together for women who want to get on boats you you've got to get out on the water on anything to do anything get out get on any boat you can possibly get on and get sail 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 then that counts it counts towards people like me who are looking for crew um and then i think you know just don't shut up about it so you <laughs> You just, you can't give up. You've got to keep going, keep going, keep going. She's great. <laughs> she might even make me into a sailor. And for those people who know me, that's a big thing. Okay, now we're going to fill the stage with some absolute sailing talent. Please, 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 can you give an amazing, I mean, there's so many of you here, give them all a huge round of applause. I'm going to invite them all up from New Zealand, two times Whitbread Round the World sailor, Leah Fanstone. <laughs> from the UK, a sailor in the Whitbread and a skipper in the Volvo Ocean Race, it is Lisa MacDonald. From the Netherlands, two-time Volvo Ocean racer and sailing her third on board Dongfeng race team, it is, of course, Carolyn Bauer. <laughs> and last but not least, from the UK, British Olympic squad and sailing her first Volvo Ocean race with Vestas 11th hour racing, it is Hannah Diamond. Woo. Woo. <laughs> Woo. 
Firstly, thank you all so much for uh, giving your time this evening, and I hope that's okay, that sunshine. Get a nice tan. <laughs> um, right, from Maiden, we jump forward to 1993-94 edition and the all-female entry of US Challenge Heineken, skippered by Dawn Riley. Now, Leah, you were a crew member on board Heineken, and I believe Abby's got a question for you. Yeah, so uh, obviously once around the world wasn't enough. So uh, what was it that drew you back to the race? Oh, goodness me. Once was definitely not enough. And the first time I went around, I was so green. I had no idea really what I was getting into. So every single moment was full of excitement and uh, all these crazy events going on. And it just went by in such a blur. It, it, I had to go back for a second time. <laughs> and the second time, I was given a much, much better opportunity uh, in a very well-organised, well-funded campaign. Um, absolutely marvellous with EF education, so couldn't couldn't resist it. <laughs> um, there's lots of other sailing races out there. I mean, obviously they're not as good, but <laughs> there are other races. Um, why the Volvo Ocean Race? Uh, well, back in the day when it used to be the whip bread, I mean, I as a child living in New Zealand, uh, and a lot of us older people will, will remember the likes of Peter Blake and Grant Dalton <coughs> and all those guys sailing into Auckland Harbour. And as a kid, I, I dreamt of doing it from a very, very early age. And um, making that dream become a reality was, uh, yeah, something that, you know, you, you, you don't think will ever happen. But reiterating Abby's words before, it's just um, hard work and, you know, creating yourself a bit of luck and just finding the right opportunities. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> right, so <laughs> we roll on to the fourth all-female team, Amber Sports 2, competing in the 2001-2002 edition of the race. And now we have five experienced crew competing previously on board EF Education. Now, Lisa, you were skipper of Amber Sports 2. It's quite a big job <laughs> being a skipper. <laughs> um, how do you go about like putting a team together and what sort of attributes do you look for? It's, um, it's a big job. It's a huge rewarding job though. And um, I think looking back on it now, one of the things that I think has been um, inherent with, with many previous girls teams is that you don't have enough lead up time. It was always my dream to try and get as many people with as much experience humanly possible through the through the training process in the beginning and a lot of that is you know as we've said before is time on the water and anything and everything but also people from the industry you know there are lots of i think that's one thing right now that um the more girls in the industry the designers the sail makers and they've got to get on the water as well and then they bring even more to to the projects and in in choosing a team it's finding the right combination of people in the right jobs that, you know, it, it's a big job actually, it's a big task to get from, you know, the lap around the planet and all the different legs and now changing them out, the boats are getting more tri technical and tricky, so, um, but it's exciting, it's hugely rewarding. So Lisa, I want you to <laughs> cast your mind back to the end of that race, we were yes. in Kiel, <laughs> I'm going to show you a photo, <laughs> most of you here in this room will know who this is. And I would like you to explain <laughs> what is going is on in that photo. Oh, priceless. <laughs> <laughs> is he here? <laughs> no, and Steph and Di, oh. you'll have to take this back to him. Make sure he sees this. <laughs> <laughs> Grant, um, working with Grant Dalton was also a big task. It was great. We had, um, we had lots of challenges along the way. And uh, <coughs> halfway through the race, he said, oh, you know, we've got to get a leg. We've got to beat him in at the end of a leg. He said, those girls are never going to beat me <laughs> in at the end of a leg, <laughs> if I can help it. And the day they do, I'll run up Queen Street <laughs> without any clothes on, <laughs> with a pineapple, <laughs> in the wrong place. <laughs> and on the last leg going into Kiel, I think that was one of the best moments for the whole team, was actually getting in on a, on a good note at the end and beating the boss. So that was top marks to all the girls. <laughs> But he's wearing all his clothes. <laughs> and I don't yeah, think Yeah, disappointing. You wait. <laughs> Not for public. We need to make this happen. <laughs> he still owes you, right? There's still time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Media team, let's make that happen. Great challenge. Um, <laughs> right, okay. And then, 
It's a massive 12 years until we see women competing in the race with Team SCA in 2014, 15th edition, breaking that pattern. Hello, <laughs> Carolyn. She was a member on board Amber Sports 2 and of course Team SCA as well. Um, what challenges did you face as a team with having such a big gap um, and that lack of experience offshore? I think basically it meant uh, we had to start from scratch and um, I uh, had the opportunity uh, to be on board uh, with Lisa and some of the girls that I've seen here as well. And uh, I think Amos Sports was very much, uh, to be honest, it was, you know, it was a b-boat campaign. Uh, there was the guys and they were in the race to win and there was a second boat. So let's uh, get some girls together and, uh, and let them race around the world and at least we'll have a story. And basically that's how it felt to me. Uh, it was a story, you know, we, um, I, I think I had a two month lead up time <laughs> till I got chucked in the Southern Ocean <laughs> on Amos Sports 2 um, with very little offshore experience. Um, and everything we had was second hand. Uh, everything the boys didn't want um, got handed over to us. Uh, and then 12 years later, um, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to sail on Team SCA, which basically was the opposite. You know, it's, a, it's like a light switch, uh, day and night. And um, it, was a, it was a first class campaign. You know, we had all the facilities and um, we had the best people around us. We had our full shore team. They were like mentors to us. Um, we had some great coaches. Uh, and we had what we thought was our asset, which was time. And um, you know, we've, we've all touched on it, and, and it's the experience that we missed. And we honestly believe with Team SCA that with an 18-month lead-up and with the best people around us, that we could um, manage to close that experience gap. But in the end, it doesn't matter really how much you train, but you have to go out there and you have to experience it. And you know, you have to go into the Southern Ocean and you have to do your brooches and you have to do your Chinese jive. And that's when you're really experiencing the <laughs> Volvo Ocean Race. And when we, with SCA, we went out and we did that. And when we crossed the finish line in Gothenburg, um, that's when we said to each other, okay, and now we're ready to race. Um, so basically, um, yeah, it's, Nothing, time doesn't replace the real experience of being out there um, racing these boats. And in the meantime, um, all the guys, they've done four editions, you know, they've been, been in the Southern Ocean eight times and, and we haven't. And so the experience gap just grows bigger and bigger and that becomes a huge challenge. Um, on top of that, I think what didn't help maybe is during that period, um, from 2001-2002 race to the 2005-2006 race, they changed boats and they became Volvo 70s. And the guys involved in, in with the boats at the time in the lead up to the race, they were um, shocked and you know the boat became a lot more physical and they were wondering how they were going to handle these brutal machines. And I think that didn't help um, because it just became an assumption then that girls wouldn't be able to handle it if the guys are already having trouble with it. And that's, well, in my eyes, it's a wrong thing. But I think that didn't help our cause um, in the end. Um, and I think it's just, you know, t times are changing. Um, I, I think uh, if we look at the Olympics, for example, and, you know, Anna, Anna was part of it in, in Rio, but... Um, uh, when, when I did the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, I was the only girl in the tornado class in the open multi-hole at the time. And eight years later, um, the, the NACRA 17s are racing as a mixed compulsory class. And I think um, ISAF, well, now World Sailing, <laughs> they took a little bit the lead in that. You know, they said, um, I think they said by 2024, we want to have... Um, um, gender equity in the sailing program in the Olympics, and I think they're going to reach that by by Tokyo by 2020. Um, and I think, yeah, they sort of, you know, s maybe set an example. And I remember talking to everyone when they talked about the NACRA and a boy and a girl on a boat, and that's not going to work. And everybody was very skeptic about it. And now we've, you know, the Rio Olympics are behind us, and nobody even talks about it anymore. It's just a normal thing. And 
I hope uh, sincerely that when we finish in in, uh, in Den Haag in uh, at the end of June this year, that it'll be the same here. You know, everybody's talking about this mixed thing, and but we're going to get over the finish line in Den Haag, and nobody will be talking about it anymore. It's just you know a normal a normal thing, and yeah, that's what I hope. So fingers crossed. That's it. Carolyn, um, cast your mind back. Leg eight of the Team SCA race. Give us a very brief uh, comment about that leg. Very brief? Yeah. We won! <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And on that note, we're going to relive the moment with the leg eight video. There are only three chances left. We've come so close so many times. We know we can sail this boat. We came out of the river and rounded Cascais, sort of behind the group. There's going to be heaps of opportunities and uh, different options up the coast and it's just a matter of being smart. It's a trim off tonight, that's what it is. And I'm taking that guy down over there. He doesn't know it yet. A tough night, to say the least, but it's a good night at the same time because we've come out of the cheer point <clears throat> this morning with a five and a half mile lead on the fleet. Our strategy seems to work and um, we were where we wanted to be. We've come so close so many times. It feels so good. It's absolutely amazing. I can't believe we actually did it. We didn't have many chances left to do it. This is the second last leg and hopefully this is just a warm up for the last leg. You actually nearly set me off again. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. Um, right, okay, now what we're going to do is fast forward uh, to this uh, current edition of the Volvo Ocean Race and a really amazing rule change. Now, it's a rule change that means that mixed crews could be a part of the Volvo Ocean Race. We now have two women competing on six 
of our teams. With, of course, sailing legend Dee Kafari, who is skippering Turn the Tide on Plastic, who is giving the mo <laughs> <laughs> Hi, May. <laughs> <laughs> Who is giving the most young women on this race the opportunity to be able to get the experience out there on the ocean. It's absolutely amazing. Um, she's chosen the fully mixed crew option, making the total women in this edition to 21. And that can have a cheers. <laughs> <laughs> And so to Hannah, Hannah, your first time competing in this race. Um, I've, I've followed your progress after the Olympic circuit. Basically, you're someone to me that has really absorbed yourself in the sport. You've taken the opportunities when they've come to you, and I think that's the reason why you're here today. So maybe talk us through that pathway just to help people, uh, to get them, give them some ideas. Yeah, so I... Um did a campaign for Rio 2016 and then NACRA 17. And actually quite a few of the people I raced against her. So, <laughs> <hey>. <laughs> um, and we went into our trials as probably the favourites. And um, unfortunately, the three events that we did, which comprised our Olympic trials, didn't go our way. So February 2016 um, kind of got to a point where I thought I didn't really plan to be in this situation and I'm not really sure what to do now. Um, I knew I wasn't ready to stop, um, but the way it works at home with our funding is that if you want to keep your funding, you have to just keep going on the circuit, regardless of whether you're going to the Games or not. And I knew that the NAC 17 was going to go through a huge change and become this foiling boat, and I kind of thought, I didn't think that was the best for continuing my learning. So um, the day that I found out we lost our trials, actually, I was asked if I wanted to go to Antigua and sail on a Cookson 50 down there with people I'd never met before. I didn't really know if I'd know what I was doing, um, but it was just exactly the right time for me to say, why not? Um, from then, I basically spent 12 months saying yes to every opportunity I got. Um, I met hundreds of people and just really spoke to as many people as I could in the industry to find out if you wanted to become a professional big boat racer, what skills did you need to have? Um, what experience did you need to have? Um, and that kind of led me to do a bit of offshore sailing um, on a class 40 um, in the UK. And uh, we do a lot of these races just across the channel to France, uh, overnight races, weekend races, that kind of thing. Um, and at the end of that year, totally by coincidence, this rule change came in. And I kind of thought, I'm under 30 and I'm female. I'd be crazy not to give this a go. Yeah. Um, so I have to say, I didn't set out when I left Olympic sailing and didn't know what I was going to be doing. I didn't know I'd be sitting here now, but um, I just tried to... My, my main aim was essentially just to become a better sailor in that time with the plan always to go back to Olympic sailing. Um, but I wouldn't want to be anywhere else apart from here right now. Exactly, and I think uh, that's the reason you are here, is the fact that you've gone and thrown yourself at every opportunity that's come your way. And I think, even as Tracy said earlier, experience is key. Getting out on the boat, getting sailing, it, it all counts. Um, I've got one cheap, like, sneaky question to put in there. Um, <laughs> so, first of all, welcome back to you and the <laughs> whole team. You. Everybody is just so happy to have you back out on the water. Um, so, huge yay from us. <laughs> Thank um, you. Is the Volvo Ocean Race exactly what you thought it was going to be? <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice small question. I don't know. I think, like Leah's answer in the beginning, the first race, there's so many things that you don't know. Every day throws some kind of surprise at you. And some, I guess, I expected to be surprised sometimes. Um, you know, I didn't expect to be doing the first leg. And then on the Friday afternoon, I had 36 hours to pack my bags to get on the boat. Um, and it's kind of continued in that theme, really. Um, you know, there's been a lot of things that um, have changed within our team, um, but no, it's not at all what I expected, <laughs> but I wouldn't change any of it. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, now... To, di to, oh, I can't speak. to diversify a little, um, but whilst recognising the greater sailing industry, and after all, we are here in Auckland, so it would be kind of rude not to, um, please can you welcome to the stage, she's the designer with the America's Cup winning team, Emirates Team New Zealand. Please can you give a huge round of applause for Elise Beavis. 
It should be on, I think. <laughs> um, welcome, and thank you so much for giving us your time. Now, what is it like creating and designing for such an amazing team? And also, can we have a sneak preview of anything that you're doing? <laughs> no? <laughs> Pro probably no sneak preview. <laughs> it's been an absolutely amazing opportunity so far to work at Team New Zealand. At working alongside the best in the industry, the best yacht designers, you know, across the board, I've learned so much, um, and to be able to do it so early on in my career is amazing. So, yeah, my dream was to work at Team New Zealand, and to be able to do go straight into it as a new grad has been absolutely amazing. Um, it's also in a really great team environment in terms of everyone's working to it together towards a common goal. Uh, everyone sort of knows what's going on in all the other areas. Uh, really great communication between everyone, so it's been awesome. And to the future, I mean, what, where do you aspire to go from here? So I've, I'm contracted for the rest of this campaign, so I'm definitely staying at Team New Zealand for the next three and a bit years. Uh, beyond that, I mean, where I am now, I want to be in the sailing industry and Team New Zealand's what I want, but... Who knows, maybe, maybe I will get over boats one day, but I don't see that happening. <laughs> um, we're going to ask a couple more questions to the panel, and I'm just giving you a little bit of a heads up, because I know sometimes it takes a little bit of warming up in the audience, but it's quite hot in here already. So uh, if you have a little think about some questions that you might want to ask our panel here, um, we're going to open the floor up. Um, so, Hannah. Um, what are the largest obstacles, do you think, in female sailors' ways um, to be, a and how can we overcome them? I think, well, so in leg one, we won, and the first question everyone wanted to know from our skipper was, what's it like to have two girls on the boat? And <laughs> they just said, well, we just sailed the leg like we would have in any other race. And as soon as it becomes the norm and it's not something that you have to talk about, then that will be a huge step forwards, I think. And I think at this stage in the race, we have got to there. Um, but I think it needs to not be a conversation. And if you didn't have to put a number on it, you know, seven and two, five and five, the different crew combinations, that would be amazing. And I think we've probably got a little bit further to go before we get to that stage, but this is a huge step in the right direction. And if it keeps going forwards with that momentum that Tracy was talking about, you know, who knows where we can get to. And Carolyn, I'm going to ask you a question. We've got a lot of younger people here tonight, so it's great to see you all here. Um, is there anything personally that you've learnt along the way that you would love to share with these people? Um, I think it's uh, don't take no for an answer. It's probably what I would <laughs> give as best advice. Um, I've seen her in the back of the room. It's Annemieke Bess. And uh, she's another Dutch sailor. And uh, she's with uh, Team Scallywag um, in this edition of the race. And I think uh, Annemieke's a pretty good example where um, she just missed out on the uh, selections for SCA. But um, she didn't just leave it there. She... Um, didn't give up and she just kept going and by the end of the race um, she was probably she had more gigs on yachts on big boats than any of us had ever dreamed of and um, she had one dream and that was to compete in the Volvo Ocean Race and she just kept pursuing that dream and I think she's now living that dream <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a pretty good dream I think because they're doing really well so she left. <laughs> She's probably hiding. <laughs> she, she was there. <laughs> okay, so we're going to open it up now. If you'd like to put your hands up, it's going to be a little bit of like a game show. So tell me, who's the first person? Great. The lady at the back who is brilliant at hand waving. <laughs> just a comment just now. <clears throat> the first question, um, when, you got, when you won your leg, what's it like to sail with two women? Um, we don't want it to be a conversation. So why are we all here tonight <laughs> celebrating women in sailing? If it, we don't want it to be the conversation. I'm sorry to be controversial. No, no, not at all. Um, for me, um, the questions that we wanted to be asked was, 
about the strategy, about the technical aspect of the race. And um, I think the fact that we get on the boat and we do a job, we, aren't, we don't have a separate area where we have to go, we don't have separate jobs. Everyone in this race mucks in. And I think it would be great if the focus could be on um, us as sailors, not us as women. And obviously there are a lot of differences and um, I think it's incredible that there are so many people here tonight. I didn't really realize it was going to be this big, <laughs> but <laughs> it's very cool. Um, but I think it's really important that we focus on the technical skills of the sailors and how we add value to the team as sailors, not just as women. Also, just to add to that as well, um, what Hannah said was completely true, but also we have to talk about it now because we're not there yet. So it's amazing to be able to come here and to be able to talk about it and have the media here and to, to tell the story because then people will look back and realize, you know, that when it isn't a conversation anymore, it is just a thing, then they'll look back and go, oh my God, this used mm. to be a thing, you know? I think, yeah, I'm just adding on. Um, next. Oh, wow. <laughs> Get your running shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> at, right at the back, the lovely lady with the black top on. <laughs> Slight challenge, Annika. Okay, um, it's a hard question, so just uh, go for it with your answer. <laughs> Women live longer, they work for fewer years, for less pay, often part-time. How do you negotiate a fair package as professional sailor women? <laughs> Well, back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go back to 93, 94. I didn't even earn any money. <laughs> so that was, yeah, that's a tricky one, wasn't it? I was going to say that I think, for me, the, the unfortunate thing is that to do this race is such a golden opportunity that you would almost do it for free. I mean, that's the sad fact that yeah. we're still in that era where... You know, I did my first race in 2001, 2002. It was a massive 12 years before I was able to do the race again. And that's really what I'm, why I'm so passionate about making it not such a, a, a gap, making this the norm that we are included and it, it's not such a golden opportunity. So, um, yeah, I think, Carolyn, you're going to add to this. <laughs> Oh, Negotiation? I, 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 don't know, I can't speak for, for all the other teams, but for myself, um, being on Dongfeng race team um, this time, it's um, w when there's, there's no difference, and I, I've said it many times, but there's no difference between um, men and women uh, on our boat. I think the differences between nationalities, cultures, um, and age on our boat is probably, are probably bigger differences than... Um, you know, then them didn't. We don't talk about it. We we step on the boat. We're we're one team, and uh, I don't know what everybody else earns uh, on the boat, but um, um, I'm happy with with what I earn, and uh, I think it's it's pretty level um, through through the team, and um, yeah, that that's it's in our in our team. There's um, yeah, that it's it's not an issue. There's no discussion about it. There's um, it's normal as as any other uh, um, profession or da daily life. So we don't we don't talk about it. We just go out and uh, and, and do our jobs. I think um, we're all uh, in this sport still um, because uh, we're crazy and uh, and we have a certain passion for for being out on the ocean and and, and being out on boats and and racing in teams. Um, that's for me is the biggest thing. Um, we have a lot of uh, s French uh, crazy solo sailors on our boat, and uh, I'd, I would never want to do what, what, what they do. I do this because, uh, because it's in a team environment, and uh, yeah, we value and, and respect each other that way, whether you are a, a sailor on the team or whether you are part of the shore team or whether you are in the logis logistics team. And uh, yeah, er everyone in, in our team is, uh, is, is the same, and there's no difference between us. And also, Richard, Abby was not saying that she would do this for free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's a, there's a lady in the middle. D, is it a D? Is that what your name is? You just put your hand up. No, I was waiting and celebrating the 
Um, I think we've got to wrap time for two more questions. Um, the lady with the lovely red hair just no. near the board there. <laughs> Not the red T-shirt. Don't worry, tomorrow you're fine. <laughs> So it might be an accent thing, but I thought she said fear instead of fair. Okay, so F-E-A-R. Can you tell us about the really scary bits? Because this is sounding a bit like the people who talk about motherhood, that it's really lovely and everybody wants to do it. Can we actually get some reality checks on some of the scary bits? It is lovely. Oh, my goodness, you've just opened a massive tin. <laughs> you don't understand. Go. Did I start. say fear or fair? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The only thing I can say is I love motherhood. My son's sitting over there, and uh, I have no fear about motherhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, life's good. <laughs> Lisa, I think you should take this. Come on. Have no fear. <laughs> um, do you know the Volvo Ocean Race actually emits every emotion humanly possible? from the, the best moment of your whole life to possibly one of the most catastrophic moments of your whole life. And um, being a, a skipper, I think for me, the only time that I was really fearful was when our boat was damaged and getting the crew and boat to safety. Um, we lost our rig in the transatlantic race in a massive nor'easter storm off the Canadian border. And we were towed in, a very long tow, with a very long tow line. Actually, I'm thinking about it now, I've, I've got wobbles in my tummy actually because the tow line we went through about 10 or 12 hours the tow line went ar, 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 and the waves were massive and we go zooming past the tow boat was was a massive icebreaker you can imagine girls yeah. <laughs> yes um and that was terrifying and I, I probably kissed the dock when we got in but um southern ocean's great so like, i mean it's all great it's all just you know a lot of big blur like we're talking about but the experience the experience is chock it up and you take that away with you wherever you go so, um, yeah, have no fear. Take it on. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for maybe one question. Yeah, oh, is that lady girl. just there? Yeah, girl down here. I'm making you run, sorry. <laughs> um, well, we've got the turn, on, turn the tide on plastics, and it's just amazing. Um, so have you guys seen a difference in the ocean? Ah. And it's interesting, because somebody... We were talking about rubbish the other day, and I don't recall seeing a lot of rubbish when I sailed around the world. Uh, and they may well be different now. I don't know. You girls? Dee can answer that one. Yeah. It'd be great, actually, if Dee could answer that. She's just at the back there. If you could give her a microphone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dee Kafari. <laughs> 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 Do you want to come up on stage? Yeah. It's quite yeah. like you to. <laughs> I'm not one to gate crash or anything. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. You are Sorry, welcome. Welcome. Come Pardon. in. I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I need counselling. Hello. <laughs> 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 oh, Hello, ladies. Oh, I'm inspired to sit with these girls. I need counselling from Lisa after this event. <laughs> and you, Lisa, amazing. Such a role model and inspiration right now. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so rubbish, my favourite subject right now. <laughs> or oh, more specifically plastic. Um, sadly, on the laps that I've done, it, it has got worse. So I think you would actually really be shocked now to actually see what we're seeing. And it's the sad reality of polystyrene, of plastic bottles, of broken buckets, plastic chairs, fishing nets... And obviously, we're concerned about our foils, but the reality is it's still there. In this last leg, we sailed past tropical paradise while a garbage lane was kind of passing along us. And it's caused by us. So, you know, just to put my flag in the sand here, we've got to make a change. And our aim with my team is to amplify that message to everyone to try and action change. Because if we all do our little bit, together we'll have a huge impact. And our ocean is our playground. We all love it. That's why we're here. And uh, we want it to last for the future generations and the young people that are sat here that are going to be sailing around the world in the future. We want to have a nice ocean for you guys. So we're trying to make a difference. Uh, can I ask one question? <laughs> Just one question before we kind of close this up. What can they do, one thing? 
Oh, it's actually really easy. It can be say no to straws in your drink. Ask for your drink without a straw in. You can have a refillable bottle that you can fill at water stations or in the gym or whatever. You can not get your addicted to coffee coffee cup from the kiosk, but take your um, thermal mug with you and ask for them to put it in that. And you take your bag for life or you take your box and you don't pick up any plastic bags. They are really simple everyday actions that you can impart now. And I had a great news story from Jack Tar on the North Wharf a month ago in preparation for us arriving. They stopped serving straws with their drinks and they had no backlash whatsoever. Of course. Um, I, I always do this. There's one last question. I know you're waving at me, but there's a really lovely little girl down. You're not little, you're tall, you're, you're a woman. <laughs> you're empowered. <laughs> Go for it. Um, what do you guys do about your periods when you're racing? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Everyone's jumping. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I take the pill continuously. I ah. don't stop taking one. I just take one, <laughs> one a day. You're too young to take that, though. <laughs> Don't try that. <laughs> but I think it is something, you know, let everyone laugh and things, but it shouldn't be, like, a barrier to people doing this kind of thing. Like, it is something that the girls on our team kind of discussed before the race, what we're going to do, and... <laughs> <it's> <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be a big issue. So um, I think it's awesome that you asked the question and yeah it gets a bit of a laugh but um those are the kind of things that if people are too scared to ask and they can see it as being something that prevents them doing what they want to do so, so it's really important do? i do the same as caroline I There's many options. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. if it was me i'd probably just crack on as normal <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh no you wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> well actually do you'd be impressed with us uh Actually, she'd be impressed with us on EF because this is kind of gross, but hey, why not? Let's get it out there. <laughs> because, you know, you would think that we might throw our sanitary items in the sea, <laughs> but we didn't. We didn't. Even back in those days. Yep, we used to have a plastic bag, which I'm pretty sure was pretty foul by the end of the race. Sorry, short team. Luckily, none of them are here. <laughs> is there uh, a reason for that? that? <laughs> no, okay. So that we could take it on land and get rid of it when we got yeah. to shore. We didn't throw anything over the side. We did throw toilet paper over the side, I'm sorry to say, but not sanitary pads. And everyone was grumpy together. So that was a good thing. <laughs> Great question. Right, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please, 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 can you give a huge round of applause as they leave the stage for Lisa Stone, for Lisa McDonald, for Carlin Brower. For Dee Gafari, Hannah Diamond, and Elise Beavis, thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And so, we're up to date, time-wise. So now to the future. I'm going to introduce someone who has a long history with this race, both as a competitor and a team manager. In fact, he managed the team SCA campaign, so I know him fairly well. Um, I'm going to welcome Richard Brissius, who's now the president of the Volvo Ocean Race. Great, and I was uh, shore manager for Team EF. That uh, was the team Leah was racing on. So <laughs> And Bridget and Karen and many others of you. It's just great to see so many of my old friends here. And, um, and uh, I've been fortunate to uh, work in this new role since uh, Cape Town. So I'm pretty new in it. Before that, I was managing teams, as you said. And, uh, and, and I must say, I'm such a big fan of all of you who are doing this race. And no one forgotten who's in here and who's out there. But it's uh, you who make this race possible. And today it's the International Women's Day, and uh, it, it needs that to get us together. And it, we shall be thankful for GSA Pindar for hosting this night tonight together with uh, Volvo. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and, and I think we have the fortune to be involved in a sport, most of us who are in here, I hope, or that you will be in the future. 
because uh, sport uh, in general, and in particular the sport of ocean racing around the world, has this capacity to bring people together across the world and showcase good and positive values such as friendship, respect, always doing our best and promoting uh, important matters for the future of, of, of the planet and for ourselves, such as Dee was talking about. And I think the matter of uh, diversity is, uh, is one of those. And um, I've, I've had the fortune to work both with EF Education, which was uh, 20 years ago, and now with Team SCA, which was three years ago. And, uh, and since then, I've also in between I've done other teams. And one thing I've learned, both working with men and women, is uh, the power of diversity. And it's not only the power of gender diversity, but also age diversity and cultural diversity. And coming from a small country, Sweden, uh, we, we, are, we are about the size of New Zealand if in comparison to, uh, to most countries. So uh, to achieve something, we have to work a bit uh, with what we have, so to say. So we put together diverse teams and it's harder to put them together. It's harder to make them work together. But what I've seen is that if you make a diverse team work very well together, you increase the performance. So to me, diversity is about increasing your chance of winning. Uh, nothing else and um, to me often you know we especially when we went into team SCA we had a lot of preconceived ideas of how would it be and the relevant questions like uh, we had here before but in reality it is uh, just what uh, Hannah said it's about sailors it's about racers it's about athletes and nothing else so and uh, and and I think that has thanks to all of the predecessors from Maiden to uh, the crews that are racing out here. They have been important uh, ambassadors for that and persons that are inspiring other, other people to do this race. And what was nice to see in Team SCA was the inspirational power that uh, this all-female crew had around the world, wherever we came. And it was exactly the same with the, with the EF education crew. And it's just amazing. And when you're in a team and you have this course, which I felt we had, uh, it just brings this internal energy that uh, makes you perform even better also. And, and you feel you're doing something good. And I remember in Newport, at the stopper in Newport, which was uh, one leg before the, the beautiful leg that you won, but in that, uh, it was a big bus in, the, in Newport and it's a uh, lot of people down in the race village and then you had all the boats lined up and this magenta colored boat. And our cameraman was interviewing someone uh, just down on the dock and then this little girl, she was uh, nine years old, I think, she came up to the cameraman, looked at this tall field and knocked on his uh, leg and said, I also have something to say and he looked down at her. And she stared straight into the camera and said, a girl can do anything a boy can do. And then she ran off. <laughs> and I think that was pretty cool because she had seen this boat and she realized, yeah, that's cool. We can also do this. Um, so talking about the future of the race, of course, diversity is at the heart of all we do in this race. And that's what we want to bring with us for the future. Our objective is not to be it, to create rules that uh, drives or forces diversity. We want it to be an ingrained part into the future of the race. And now we have done learnings in each edition of the race. We've done learnings in this race and we are halfway through and towards the end we'll gather everyone and of course in particular uh, the women and men on these boats and understand, okay, what have we learned from the current rules? Are they good? Can we improve it even more? to achieve what we try to do, which is uh, performing better and a sport that is uh, available for everyone, men and women. And I think uh, the Magenta project to me is such a wonderful thing because it's not based out of a, a drive to win something or a drive to make money or anything. It's, it's uh, in place just to be able to make it possible for you young girls who are here and loves racing to be able to perform in the future at the top level of the sport. So to all you volunteers who are making the Magenta project uh, possible, I would like to, uh, I think we should give you a big applaud, everyone in here, no one forgotten, but well done.
So uh, that's it. That's what I had to say. And I thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, Abby, Joe, well done. Where's Joe? There you are. <laughs> thank you. I think the keynotes that are coming out of tonight are that momentum and continuity are key in a sport that rewards experience and in order to build up the number of talented female athletes. How long will it take to get to a point where there is as many women as men in, with the right experience and skills participating at the top level of offshore sailing? Well, we think that the answer to that lies within the people in this room and of course the people in the sailing community outside this room as well. If every person took one positive action that created an opportunity for a female sailor to gain um, some experience or some skills or looked at how they could contribute to developing a pathway for women at a performance level in sailing, these aspirations would be one step closer. Yes, at the Magenta Project, we are trying to make a difference uh, to get women to the top of sailing, but we need your support, um, we need your drive, we need to make a lasting change. So, make this International Women's Day the day that you decide to bring our sport into the 21st century and ensure that the next generations that we have here will wonder what all the fuss was about. Yes, my friend. May I, I would, like to say something. would you like me to give you a microphone? You've made the effort to stand up. I'm going to bring it to you. Thank you, Go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm very privileged because I've been involved with this event for 45 years going right back to 1973, when the first race came to Sydney. That race was won by Sayola too, Raymond Carlin. And I've been involved in every one ever since, including being chairman of public relations and media twice. I've seen all the changes. I've seen the efforts to raise money to keep boats going. It was a, probably a very positive thing that Whitbread decided to withdraw and did a very good arrangement for Volvo. Because without Volvo, this race would not have survived. It really had got to that point, and I want to pay tribute to Volvo for the most outstanding job they've done in keeping this race alive. And tonight has been incredibly special because I'm all for women being involved in the race, and I can tell you, I well remember in 80, 1990, uh, with Tracy Edwards being presented with her award here in Auckland when she was made Yachtswoman of the Year and made a wonderful speech. It was actually presented to her by the late Sir Peter Blake. Um, I actually have a record of it, and. I think of the other woman, Cecilia Unger, who took over a boat called Great Britain II, which was originally built by a chap or designed by Alan Gurney. It sailed in the first race, and it was actually skippered by a whole team of paratroopers led by a famous yachtsman by the name of Shea Blythe. But um, it then became uh, United Friendly and was taken over by Cecilia Unger, who was another person who... Uh, made a contribution to this wonderful event. And I well remember Maiden. In fact, I remember flying um, over Maiden as she went down the Coromandel Coast just so that we could take pictures of her from the air. So a great tribute to Volvo, and I think that you have done a wonderful job in making this such a special evening. Now, I can smell the canapes and I know the drinks are on the way. 
But just before I say thank you to everybody, um, I've got one quick thing to do. Stacey, where are you? Bring that wonderful haircut on this stage. <laughs> Stacey Jackson um, is sailing with Vestas 11th Hour Racing. She <laughs> hates microphones. Don't touch her. Just come on stage. <laughs> Come on stage and I'll stand away. It's okay, don't worry. A fist pump. Yeah, <laughs> good. Okay, so very quickly, um, Stacey's very irritating because um, she's not only like a really talented sailor, <laughs> but she's also like really talented at doing this as well. Um, so Stacey has actually used um, local um, recycled bits of sail um, to make these amazing bags. When do you find the time? This is crazy. Now, the, can I, can I, yep, I like that one. Um, so <laughs> there are loads of bags apart from that one um, that are going to be given away now. Um, uh, these are actually also, um, not here, but if you were interested in these, the company's called Naughty Bags. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great name. <laughs> I like really laughed. Um, the founder is Stacey Jackson, legend, um, and she's based in Brisbane and somewhere around the world at some point. She's a sail maker and a sailor, and she makes awesome things. And also, they're recycled, so why wouldn't you? Um, so we've got these to give away. So if I could have some help from people, that would be great because I've got heels on. Um, so Magenta Project, I can hand them out. Come on, Abby, Libby, get yourself over here. Right. Okay. So we've got some people on this list um, that have won. Yeah. Um, Greta Pilkington. Where are you? Yeah. <laughs> I like that you give the one that I like the most away first. <laughs> Polly Powery. Hey. Chloe Salthouse. EJ Moffat, great name. Great. <laughs> Olivia Hamlin. You got it? Yep. And last but not least, we have got one more bag, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, last but not least, Anne Peratt. And if I said any of those names wrong, I'm really sorry. Um, okay. Coming. Yeah. She's coming. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. Okay. Now. That just leaves Abby and I to say a massive, massive thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much to all of the fabulous women that have come today to entertain you and tell you stories and highlight all of the awesome things that need to be highlighted today. Um, thank you to Abby for organizing tonight's <laughs> event. It's not, you would never know this, but it is not her favorite thing to do. <laughs> and you smashed it. Um, thank you to the Magenta Project. <laughs> thank you to Volvo for housing our event tonight in this amazing pavilion. Thank you from all of us to the Volvo Ocean Race for the continuing amazing support. Thank you to the Auckland Stopover for being <laughs> just Auckland. <laughs> what else do you need to say? It's just great. Um, thank you to GAC and to Andrew Pindar. Without this, tonight would not have happened. But mainly, our thank yous go to each and every single one of you. Um, without you guys, this would not be an event. Without your interest, it wouldn't be a Volvo Ocean race. Um, now, we want to thank you for coming, but we also want to thank you for any changes that you make, no matter how big or small. 
And let's celebrate women's achievements, not just once a year, like every single minute of every single day. Why not, eh? <laughs> If you want some more information about the, uh, about the Magenta Project, I think there's a little uh, cool animation that might happen. There we go. Uh, you can go there and find out more information about them. Uh, drinks and canapes are going to be served right now. The doors are going to open. They're going to fly out and feed you. Um, can I just ask one question? Can all of the previous and present shore crew and sailors of the Volvo Ocean Race and the Whitbread Round the World come onto stage? We're going to have one big last final hoorah and a great picture. Don't be, don't be shy. Thank you all so much. Happy International Women's Day and have an amazing evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing event, amazing turnout. Give us a quick reaction to what we just saw. I think, as you said, it's been fantastic to see such a turnout and, um, and, and a great um, to be able to sort of cover the spectrum of the race um, from Leah, you know, Lisa, and then through to Hannah, who's doing her first race. Uh, some great stories to tell, and I think um, the audience have obviously asked some great questions as well. And I think, all in all, we've just had a, a fantastic evening. We, are, we have a really great turnout, as I say, from kind of over the, the Bob Ocean Race eras as well. Um, and we have a lot of very young girls in there as well. So how important is this, do you think, for inspiring the next generation to, to tell them that there are no barriers and they can basically mm. do everything? I think it's really important. I mean, I've just said goodbye to a couple of girls and they've said to me, it's amazing that you make yourself so accessible. I mean, I think any of us who are competing in this race, we're role models to the younger generation, but I think maybe we're just untouchable. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're dreaming of doing this race and yet to be able to meet us, to talk with us, um, to, to hear our stories and, and for us to be able to share our experiences with them. I mean, that surely that's what it's all about and about inspiring the next generation. And a, and a really good turnout, I think, from across the teams as well. So it's not like a one team thing. And, and actually, um, you know, we've got probably most of, if not all, the women sailors from this current edition here supporting you. So it must feel really good for the Gents Project to know that you've got the support of of a whole race behind you. Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's what the, the Magenta Project is really, it's there to provide opportunities, to give inspiration to others, and to prove as, you know, to that little girl that she said that you have to dream big and never say no to anything. And uh, I mean, that's, that's here what we're, what we're trying to do. We, we love what we do, we love sailing. And uh, if we can share that and create opportunities uh, and give our experience to those that are coming up, I mean, that's really, what it's all about. Final question, you've been doing this race now for over 15 years, I believe. First one, 2001. Uh, you're still doing it, still enjoying it, I believe. So what's the, you know, how, what do you think the state of kind of women in the Volvo Ocean Race is now and what do we need to do to improve it even further in the future? I think the, the, the biggest heartache for me was finishing that race in 2001, 2002. It was completely green. And as Leah Fanstone said this evening, I mean, you finish that race, you're just buzzing with excitement. You're buzzing with ideas. And to not be able to impart that onto the next race and to take all that knowledge and all that experience and, and put that energy into another project. You know, it was another 12 years before I had the chance again. And, uh, and it was such a golden opportunity with, with Team SCA. And here I am again. This has been a golden opportunity to be able to sail with people like Bow Becking, who've done this race eight times, you know, and, and we started, I uh, raced against him in the 2001 race. And yet he's been there racking up race after race after race. So to be able to learn from him, to be able to learn from the other guys on board, that's been um, a real pull. And uh, yeah, I love this race. I love offshore sailing, um, and it, this is the pinnacle of offshore, sp offshore sailing. And one more final, final question. Uh, you know, the Magenta Project, there's, there's a lot of you working towards this, this project and this goal, and actually you're all very busy, and you're, a lot of you are actually doing the race right now. So, you know, you could almost question, well, why, why bother, because you're kind of okay. So what's the motivation for you to put so much time and effort into arranging stuff like this and working for the Magenta Project? Yeah. I think the motivation for me personally is not to see that 12-year gap. You know, this this is a, a 
great race it's and there's no reason why um, women and girls can't be competing in it and so to keep that momentum and to keep that continuation that's that's really what we're about and um, probably why I feel so passionately is I want others to be able to do what I'm been able to do and to not see that that gap in the future. Thank you.